Well, at the heart of understanding all types of weather, especially severe weather, we need to understand the basics of temperature, pressure, and moisture. And in this particular video, we're going to talk about pressure. And we're going to first start by talking about this guy. This is Aristotle. I'm going to take you back to 340 BC when he was writing a book called Meteorologica, where he was trying to basically understand all things about the weather. And in his book, he was writing about a particular question he was getting asked. And that question was, does air have mass? So Aristotle decided to perform a simple experiment. He got himself a very precise set of scales, like the ones that you see over here on the right-hand side of the screen. And what he then got was a wineskin. This is usually a piece of like animal hide or leather that is kind of bound up and therefore we can pour liquid into it like wine and it can contain that wine. Well, what he got was an empty wineskin and he put it on his scales and measured its mass. He then took the wineskin off and blew it full of air and put it back on the scales and determined that the mass when it had air in it versus when it did not have air in it was exactly the same. And in his book, he wrote down that air has no mass. Now, we live in a post-Newton world, and so we understand that a force is a mass times an acceleration. So, for example, as you move your hand throughout the air, if you kind of just wave it in front of you, you can feel the force exerted by the air on your skin. It's like the wind. And therefore, we know that it has mass because we can feel the force. So what's interesting is his experiment, which was quite clever, it didn't exactly measure what he set out to measure. And the big reason why, when he put the wineskin on one side of his scales, when it was empty, he was actually already measuring all of the air above it, which means when he filled it up with air, that same air was now just inside of the skin, whereas before it was outside. But it was a very, very interesting experiment. Well, let's fast forward a little bit here. I'm going to take you to the 1600s to Germany. We're looking at a scene here that was sh basically shown where we have, uh, looks like 16 horses, eight on each side, pulling on these two spheres. They're called Magdeburg spheres. And the person who was performing this demonstration was a guy by the name of Otto von Gurich. And this particular scientist had invented a vacuum pump, and he wanted to prove how powerful his vacuum pump was. So he connected these two half spheres to his pump and began to suck the air out from the inside of them. And after removing better than 90% of the atmospheric pressure from the inside, he would then, you know, whip the horses and try to get them to pull them apart. And basically the horses could not. And that's because it would require several thousand pounds of force to get these spheres apart. Now, why is that? Well, take a look at this image. You see, before the vacuum was applied, the air pressure and air density on the inside of the spheres equal that on the outside. Now, what is air pressure? It's a collision force. It's the force exerted by the air against a surface, in this case, the surface of the spheres. Well, when the air density and air pressure is equal on either side, well, you can easily take them apart and put them back together. But if you were to remove the air from the inside. You now have fewer molecules colliding with the surface on the inside compared to the outside. Now, I have a pair of Magdeburg spheres that are only five inches in diameter, not several feet in diameter like the ones that you just saw. And it turns out you need to be able to pull about 300 pounds of force to get them apart, and they're just five inches in diameter. It's incredible to think about how powerful of a force air pressure is. Now, ultimately, when we talk about air pressure, it's about a discussion trying to understand why the wind blows. So check out this animation. It's from earth.nullschool.net, a fantastic website you should check out. Now, right here over the Netherlands, there was a deep area of low pressure, and you can see the wind spiraling into it right there very fast. Well, on the day that this occurred, one of my former students took this video for me from a square here in the Netherlands. And check out what those winds were doing as they raced between some buildings. Here it goes. Watch this guy. <laughs> there was a gust in there of about 70 miles an hour. And that's what happens when you focus the air into a tight space, like between buildings like this. Plus, on basically surrounding the town, we had a large pressure gradient. That's a change in pressure over change in distance. And boy, it blew that guy and that girl in the background right over. It's incredible to see what the wind can do. So we're studying how this all works. Now, let's get down some simple definitions about air pressure. What is it? Well, atmospheric pressure, again, is the force per unit area applied by the air. Now, I will let you think about it as the weight of the air, the weight of the air above uh, an area, like maybe a square inch. 
You see, if you look over here on the right-hand side, what I just drew is a column going up from the surface, or sea level, all the way to the top of the atmosphere. You can see that atmospheric density, which is represented here with these dots, these are air molecules, gets basically lower and lower and lower with height. In fact, it doesn't just get lower with height, it gets exponentially lower with height, which means as you go up in the atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure drops off dramatically. Now, we're going to talk about why air is held in place on Earth in a few moments, but this is where we start. Now, if we're going to think about it as the weight of the air above a, in a column above an area like this, we want to measure how much it weighs. Well, it turns out if you hold out your hand and you draw one square inch on your palm and you're standing at sea level and you weighed all of the air from your palm clear to the top of the atmosphere, it weighs 14.7 pounds. So the at standard atmospheric pressure is 14.7 pounds per square inch. Now, in atmospheric sciences, we don't use PSI, or pounds per square inch. We use a unit called the millibar, and we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. Standard sea level pressure is 1,013.25 millibars, and that's going to be a benchmark number we're going to talk about quite a bit this semester. Now, another way by which we measure pressure is looking at a uh, barometer, particularly a mercury barometer. And under standard sea level pressure, we can push the mercury 29.92 inches up inside of the mercury barometer. We'll talk more about that in just a few moments. Now, one thing I want to clear up really quickly here, since we're thinking about this as the weight of the air in a column above some area, why then don't you feel the weight of the atmosphere relieved when you go inside? Wouldn't the roof of the building support the weight of the atmosphere? Well, it's this, the answer to this question is the same answer to, well, why don't you feel only the weight of the water above you when you swim down to the bottom of a deep pool? You feel the pressure on all sides. And that's because the water pressure in the pool is a three-dimensional force. It's pushing up, it's pushing down, and it's pushing sideways. It's the same with the air. That's why you don't ever feel as though you're carrying the weight of the atmosphere on your shoulders. Now, let's keep going with this. I want to give you some benchmark values, and we're going to start off with a massive Siberian high-pressure system. That's uh, on the other side of the planet from where I'm recording this video right now, and in the middle of winter, it can get so bitterly cold that the atmosphere becomes so dense that the pressure builds up quite high. Now remember, standard sea level pressure is 1,013.25. When one of these Siberian high-pressure systems set up, the pressure can go way up to around 1,050 millibars. In fact, the record is 1,084. We here in the United States can often get these big arc or Canadian high pressure systems like we did on January 3rd that spill in this incredibly cold air into the central part of the United States that uh, well, the pressure there can get up to around 1,040, maybe 1,050 millibars. When this happens, it's extremely cold. The winds are very light because the pressure gradient is weak. The air is very dense. You have clear skies. And we often find that we have descending air aloft, which is why the skies are so clear. I think we're going to learn a lot about this semester. How about another benchmark value? Check out the animation that's down there in the, in the bottom left. There was a massive blizzard that hit uh, the United States on April 13th, 2018. And that blizzard did some pretty amazing things like drop all of this snow here from basically Nebraska all the way through parts of South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin. A feet, feet of snow April 13th, an incredible system. Now, these strong winter storm systems, they typically happen when we have a range of pressures around 970 to around 1,000 millibars. So what I want you to see is that is lower than our standard sea level value. And this is the most important thing to see. You see, higher atmospheric pressures, higher than 1,013.25. Lower atmospheric pressure when the weather is quite inclement. In other words, we have strongly contrasting temperatures, clouds, rain, sleet, snow, and it's very windy. Well, that happens when the pressure drops off. On this particular day, not only do we have a bunch of snow on the back side of this low, but the low pressure center was right here, and draping to its south was a pretty powerful front. And you can actually see out ahead of that front, we had almost 350 reports of severe weather. That included 32 tornadoes, 161 wind reports, and 154 reports of hail. You see, these big winter uh, cyclones, the ones like you see here, can do it all. They can produce sleet, freezing rain, snow. They can also produce heavy, heavy rainfall and a bunch of severe weather. Now, let's take it another step up. What you've got here is a weak hurricane. You're looking at an animation over there on the right, a radar animation, of Hurricane Dolly. Now, hurricane Dolly back in 2008 was a relatively weak hurricane. Yeah, it had sustained winds at one point of 100 miles an hour, but that's really a pretty weak hurricane. At landfall, it was a Category 1 strength hurricane with a pressure of 963 millibars. Now, that's significantly lower than the big winter storm I just told you about. 
but still, it's pretty weak for a hurricane. Again, you can see that we're getting to deeper and deeper low pressure systems that are more powerful, and as a consequence, the pressure is decreasing. Now let's compare this to a powerful typhoon. You see powerful typhoons and hurricanes, which are basically just different names for the same type of weather system, their pressure can get quite low. You're watching an animation, this is a satellite animation of Super Typhoon Haiyan back in 2013. It was a category five strength storm with sustained winds at one point of 195 miles an hour. Its pressure, 895 millibars. That still doesn't get, well, too close to the world record, where sea level pressure in the middle of Super Typhoon Tip back in 1979 got all the way down to 870 millibars. So these are some benchmark values. Basically what you just saw here is as the pressure gets lower and lower, the weather gets worse and worse. Okay. Have you ever been on an airplane and the flight attendant in the middle of the safety demonstration at the beginning tells you that in the event of a cabin pressure loss to put your mask on first, it'll drop down from above and you put this oxygen mask on. I often wondered why we were always told to put our masks on first before helping other people. You see, in the previous slides, I showed you quite a range in pressure from 870 millibars all the way up to 1,084. But what's kind of interesting is that if I were to change the atmospheric pressure where you are right now, that full range, 870 to 1,084, uh, about the only thing you might feel would be maybe your ears would pop a few times. Other than that, you wouldn't feel too much uh, you know, sensation. You really wouldn't be able to tell that it changed too much. But if you're flying at 30,000 or 40,000 feet, the atmospheric pressure outside the plane is exceptionally, exceptionally low. We just saw that a moment ago. We know that pressure decreases rapidly as you ascend. Now, I always wondered why put your mask on first? And then I found out the answer. The answer lies in an understanding of the condition called hypoxia. And I watched this video once where they put this guy, this guy right here, inside of a chamber where they were able to decompress the chamber, take all the air out of it. And what they did was after they rapidly decompressed the chamber, they started asking him questions. He was asked here, what's nine minus five? And he answered correctly, four. But this was only about 20 seconds into the simulation. Right now he's breathing the air density equivalent at being at around 45,000 feet. This is what it would be like if a plane lost pressure. A few moments later, he's asked to identify cards. You can see the guy over here is holding up a card. Now notice he doesn't have his mask on. So he's sitting over here and he basically sees that the card has, uh, what is it there? It looks like it's the eight of spades, right? Or not the eight of spades, the eight of clubs. He correctly identifies that, but this is only about 30 seconds into the simulation. A few moments later, he's given this children's toy where you basically match the shapes and put them in their appropriate spots. About a minute into this, he can't do it. He's holding the oval and he just keeps twisting the thing over and over and doesn't even know that the oval is right there. He's given a star a few moments later after the guy helps him put it in and he just keeps twisting the toy over and over and over again. After about three or four minutes of this, he's sitting there looking at the guy who's actually got oxygen that's in the simulation with him and the guy says, you need to put your mask on or pull up your switches or you're going to die. He's basically telling them that if he does not put his mask back on and get oxygen back to his brain, he's maybe got another minute to live before, well, before he dies. Basically, hypoxia can kill you. And what was crazy about this video is this guy just kept spinning this over and over in his hands, not even knowing that the other guy was talking to him. Just a few minutes in a chamber where the atmospheric pressure is so low and he can't even think or react to a very simple statement, pull up the switches or you will die. Now, the other guy steps in and puts his mask on for him, and he does it about probably 20 seconds before this guy passes out. And after that, he asks some simple questions. What's eight minus three? And immediately, once he gets oxygen back to his brain, he says five. So what's amazing here is just to understand that we, as humans, really are only capable of surviving very, very close to the Earth's surface, where the pressure is quite high. It's very, very challenging to live at high altitudes where the pressure is low. Again, this is called hypoxia. This is basically when the brain is starved of oxygen. It was an amazing experiment here. So why put your mask on first? Because after just a few moments, at really, really low atmospheric pressure, you suffer through hypoxia and you may not even be able to put your mask on, let alone the mask of a person sitting next to you. So that's why you always do yours first. Now here's the good news. If a plane ever loses pressure, it will rapidly descend so that it gets to higher and higher air pressure and therefore nobody passes out. But it's an interesting consequence of being at such high altitude.
Okay, how do we measure pressure? Well, we initially started measuring pressure with the instrument you see way over here on the right. This is an old school mercury barometer. It doesn't work like a thermometer. It works a lot differently. You see, when they build these, they take a tube like this tube you see here and a dish like the one you see here and put it into a complete vacuum. And they fill up the bottom of the dish with mercury. They then repressurize the tank. And when they do that, the mercury goes shooting up inside the tank. Under standard sea level pressure, which is pushing down on the open dish of mercury at 14.7 pounds per square inch, well, the mercury will move up the tube to 29.92 inches above the base. Therefore, standard sea level pressure will push mercury up a vacuum tube 29.92 inches. Now, a lot of TV meteorologists still like to talk about pressure in inches of mercury, but it's a very difficult unit to kind of get used to. So what I want you to remember is this, if the air pressure is increasing, the mercury goes up higher. So anything above 29.92 generally means better weather. When the weather's getting worse, the pressure will drop. So if they say the pressure is 29.92 and falling, that means the weather conditions will be deteriorating. Now, we don't use mercury barometers very often. They're very large, and of course, mercury is poisonous. So instead, we use something like this quite a bit. This thing right here is an aneroid cell barometer. And inside here, there's basically a chamber. It's partially evacuated. And what happens is, as the atmospheric pressure increases, it squeezes in on the chamber, shrinking it. Well, that little chamber is connected to a couple of spindles and levers, and it moves a needle, which you see right here around on a dial. Now, here's what the top-down view of that dial looks like. Can you see where there's lower atmospheric pressure over here on the dial? We have stormy conditions or rainy conditions. Where we have higher atmospheric pressure over here in the dial, it's fair and very dry, nice weather conditions. Turns out we don't even really use these aneroid cells too much either. Most common types of barometers that we use now are very, very small capacitance-based barometers, which are similar to aneroid cells, but very, very tiny, maybe the size of like a pencil eraser, or they're piezo-resistive. These are basically materials, some certain crystals even, where when they're squeezed by the atmosphere, it changes their electrical properties. Basically, voltage flows through them differently. But I want to show you these two most common methods. Last thing I want to talk about when measuring pressure is altimeters. On every single airplane, there is an altimeter. I'll circle the one that's on this one. It's right there. Now, how does the altimeter work? Well, it's designed to tell you how high you are in the atmosphere. But in reality, airplanes don't have a ruler uh, basically connecting them from the ground up to the plane. What the altimeter is, is it's a very sophisticated, highly calibrated aneroid cell barometer. Now, this is what's neat. Imagine you were in an airplane and uh, you were flying from, um, you intended to fly from New York to Seattle, and you wanted to fly at a constant altitude. Well, if you took off, let's say you took off at an altitude of nine kilometers above the surface of the earth where the air pressure is 300 millibars. Now, if you never once, as you flew, adjusted your altimeter, in fact, it's kind of hard to see here, but this little thing right there is a little adjustment knob. I tried to draw a long arrow to it. If you never adjusted your altimeter as you flew, you would think you flew at this altitude. But in reality, you'd fly like that. And that's because the thickness of the atmosphere is dependent on temperature. Where it's warm in the eastern half of the country, we have a much thicker atmosphere. Where it's cooler in the western half of the country, it's much more compact. So as a consequence, your actual flight path would look just like this. Even though you thought the entire time you were flying at 9 kilometers, you may have dropped as much as a full kilometer in the atmosphere, even though you didn't even know it. It's amazing to think about that, but that's why they train pilots uh, to be on the lookout for, they have a phrase, it's called high to low lookout below. If they fly from a region of higher air pressure to lower air pressure and don't adjust their barometers as they fly, well, they can actually descend in the atmosphere, which can cause major problems. Now, let's come to this slide. Take home point from all of this. I've got this massive winter storm as seen from satellite up here, and I even drew a big comma-shaped cloud field over the top of it so you can see really where the big cloud field is there. I'll move it so you can see it. Do you notice down here in the map below it, which is a surface pressure map, that right here near Duluth, Minnesota, the atmospheric pressure got down to 975 millibars. I'm sorry, 957 millibars. And the air was rapidly accelerating and swirling into the center of this low to fill in that void. Because of that, we got this huge cloud field. On the back side, a blizzard back here. Flooding rains out ahead of it and a severe weather outbreak to the south.
When that happened, these aneroid barometers like the one you see up here, well, they went spinning all the way over to the other side like this. Water barometers like the one that you see here, well, the water in this, uh, in this pipe actually would spill out of the top. This is what mine did on the day when we had this particular event. And this is what happens. When the pressure drops off, when basically goes below standard sea level pressure, which is about 1,000 millibars, expect clouds, precipitation, and unsettled weather. Throughout this semester, by the way, I'll abbreviate weather as WX. That's the Morse code uh, uh, way we, we type in weather. When the high pressure, uh, when high pressure builds in, air pressure gets higher, we get fair weather, nice weather. On this particular day, when that low pressure system went over, it broke some barometers. Check this out. Here's one barometer where it actually went so far off its scale, it broke and it never came back. Pretty amazing to see that. Okay, ultimately though, when we talk about pressure, it's with its relationship to wind. So here's a question. What is the fastest wind ever measured on Earth, not in a tornado or hurricane? Don't get out your phone, don't Google this, just listen. What do you think it is? Fastest wind ever on Earth, not in a tornado or hurricane. 131, 231, 331, 431 are faster than 431 miles an hour. Got your answer? Well, it turns out that wind speed was set right here in Mount Washington, which is in the northeastern part of the United States. Mount Washington sometimes in winter looks incredible. Check out these pictures here in a few moments. Here's the sign that's on the weather observation station at Mount Washington. The highest wind ever observed, 231 miles an hour. Now that's outside of a hurricane. Hurricanes could go faster than that, so can tornadoes. But outside of that, 231 miles an hour. In winter, here you go, Mount Washington often looks like this. That's where ice is basically rhymed against the buildings. People work inside that. <laughs> incredible to see this. Now why does Mount Washington have such incredible weather? Well, when we look at it here, we look at kind of the mountains that surround it, there are a couple of very interesting topographical features that focus the wind right over the top of the mountain. Plus the mountain's very tall. It sticks up pretty high into the atmosphere, up near the jet stream, where the winds are automatically going to be a lot faster. So that's a couple of the reasons why. Now, this gets to the main idea of this lecture, so tune me in here. I want you to understand both vertical and horizontal pressure variations. Let's start in the vertical, because ultimately we're trying to determine why the wind blows. Now, we know, we've seen this multiple times, air pressure, air pressure decreases rapidly with height. In fact, it's exponential with height. But what I want you to remember is this. Air resists vertical motion. It doesn't want to go up or down. And that's because as the air is compressed down toward the surface by gravity, that kind of spring-loaded force kind of pushing it back up is a consequence of the fact there's higher pressure always at the surface and lower pressure as you go up. So there's always this strong vertical pressure gradient force. That's basically the force that the air is trying to create where it is wanting to just escape into outer space. Why doesn't it? Well, gravity holds it in place. You see, we call this hydrostatic balance. Hydro, fluid, static, not moving. And basically, the air resists going up and down because the vertical pressure gradient is matched by gravity. Now, in a few moments, we're going to talk about what would happen if we could shut off gravity. What would the air do? Keep this in mind when we get to that question. Here's the next thing I want to ask you. Have you ever been attacked by your shower curtain? Okay, imagine you're in the shower, taking a really hot shower, right? And all of a sudden, the shower curtain starts to kind of encroach on your space. Why does it do that? Well, it does that because of this simple principle. Air always moves from higher air pressure to lower air pressure. So my little diagram here, can you imagine that this is the shower curtain? Now you're on the inside over here where you've got the shower on and it's very, very hot. So the air in here is hot because it's being heated up by the temperature of the water. Also, the water's moving, and you get a Bernoulli effect out of that, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this class to explain. But that hot air, and that dude basically did the hot water here, pushes the air over the top of the shower curtain, or maybe around the shower curtain, and it goes over here to the rest of your bathroom. Therefore, the air density and air pressure is higher on the other side of the shower curtain. Well, naturally, when that happens, a wind forms, it's very subtle, in your bathroom, pushing the shower curtain into you. There's a very, very simple remedy to this. I know a lot of you may have just said, well, I'm going to pile up all the shampoo bottles or stand on the bottom of the shower curtain. Well, just buy a shower curtain with weights at the bottom or magnets or buy a heavy decorative outer shower curtain that can take the weight of the atmosphere pushing against it. 
But the idea is simple. Air moves always from higher air pressure to lower air pressure. Don't forget that. You see, air moves because of horizontal pressure differences. Higher pressure in one location, lower pressure in another. It always tries to move from the higher pressure location to lower. And the greater that change, the greater the change in pressure over some change in distance, the faster the wind will be. And we're going to look at that in the next few moments. Check this out. I got a picture from the Hurricane Hunter over here on the left. You're in the middle of the eye wall of Hurricane Katrina. The tops of these clouds up here, maybe 30,000 feet above the ground. It's incredible. Now, in the middle of Katrina, the air pressure bottomed out at about 900 millibars. But in the eye wall, which is this cloud feature you see here, which, by the way, is spinning at around 175 miles an hour, well, the air pressure there has increased to 950 millibars, which means we had a pressure change of 50 millibars over a distance of around 25 kilometers. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, that pressure change, 50 millibars over 25 kilometers, was worth a wind speed of 175 miles an hour. Now, check this out. Here's the bottom of the Willis Tower in Chicago. Normal pressure at the bottom here, about 1,000 millibars. If you ever ride the elevators and go to the observation deck at the top, the pressure up there, 950 millibars. That's the same change in pressure as we saw in Hurricane Katrina. But instead of happening over 25 kilometers, it only happened over about a half a kilometer. Which is why when you ride you know, the elevator to the top of the Willis Tower, your ears will probably pop several times. Now, earlier I posed a question. What would happen if we shut off gravity? Now, we cannot do that. So don't worry about it. But if all of a sudden air was allowed to escape to space, it would accelerate off of the surface of the Earth at 1 g. Now, what's 1 g? Well, it's 9.8 meters per second squared. That is the force of gravity. And that means the air will accelerate at an incredible rate. 9.8 meters per second squared, that's probably faster than most of you have ever accelerated in a car. In fact, let's talk about cars. Let's stage a race. The air leaving Earth's surface versus, uh, I don't know, a Bugatti Veyron. Who would win the sprint to 60 miles an hour? Well, the Bugatti can do it in about 2.5 seconds. It'll take the air a little bit longer, 2.7 seconds. From there, the Bugatti is done. After just 10 seconds, the Bugatti will probably winding up to a speed somewhere around 150 miles an hour. Uh, the air, 219. After 30 seconds, the Bugatti is done. It's out of gas. It shreds its tires at top speed. Uh, the air moving roughly 650 miles an hour. That's how quickly the air would leave Earth's surface if it wasn't balanced by gravity. So there is always, listen to this, there's always a strong vertical pressure gradient, but it's balanced by gravity. And that's why whenever we make massive thunderstorms, it's very hard to get air to ascend and descend. We're going to talk about that very soon. But it's easy to get air to move horizontally, and that is what causes the wind to blow. Now, let me ask you this question before we move on here. I want you to imagine that you packed a nearly empty bottle of shampoo in your luggage before you took a road trip. You're going to drive, okay, from Chicago, Illinois to Denver, Colorado. Chicago's elevation is approximately 600 feet above sea level. Denver, Colorado's elevation is basically a mile, 5,280 feet above sea level. That's why they call it the Mile High City. Now, my question for you is, you pack this nearly empty bottle of shampoo in your luggage, and you drove from Chicago to Denver. What does it look like when you get to Denver? Does it A, look like it's about to explode? Does it B, does it look like it's about to implode? Or is it C, it'll look the same? Well, let's answer this question. When we sealed the bottle, we did so in Chicago at high atmospheric pressure. So the air pressure inside the bottle was the same as it was outside in Chicago, which is relatively high. When we got to Denver, we went up in the atmosphere a full mile. The atmospheric pressure dropped 150 millibars along the trip, which means the inside internal pressure will be trying to equalize with the much lower outside pressure. And what do you get? A, a bottle that's about to explode. Never pack a nearly empty bottle of shampoo and change elevation. That's the rule of thumb here. All right. Here's another interesting thing. I have on my cell phone, which is a screen grab that you see right here, a barometer. Most cell phones have barometers in them now. And what I have here is I had a very, very interesting flight that I took out to Lincoln, Nebraska. And I'm going to tell you about it. Now, I drove from Champaign up to Chicago to catch a flight. And on my way out there, my drive from Champaign to Chicago, I saw a very, very subtle 
increase in atmospheric pressure. See it right there? It just kind of slowly ramps up. The reason why that is, Chicago's roughly 100 feet lower than it is here in Champaign-Urbana where I'm doing this recording. So when I got there, the pressure was higher because I went down. I got on the plane, and the plane cruised at an altitude, I think it was right around 30,000 feet. Now, at 30,000 feet outside the plane, the pressure is very low, approximately 300 millibars. But I'm inside an airplane where they pressurized the cabin. And they pressurized it, you can see down that's how low it got, to around 800 millibars. Now, that's still pretty low. My ears pop several times. But it's 800 millibars inside the plane, 300 millibars outside the plane. Now, when I landed here, so let's go back to this. When I landed here uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, the uh, Lincoln, Nebraska is around 500 feet in elevation higher than Champaign-Urbana. So therefore, look at the pressure. Look right here. The pressure was lower than it was in Champaign-Urbana. I was there for just a day, and I got back on a plane to fly back home, and I will never, ever forget the flight home. You see, we flew at the same cruising altitude, well, at least we were supposed to. Halfway up on that plane ride, we just were taking off halfway to our, our altitude that we're going to fly at. I was sitting in the fourth row, and all of a sudden, I hear from the front right door, Psh! you know, really loud like that, and I was freaking out. Now, I fly... I don't know, probably a hundred times a year. I unfortunately have to fly quite a bit. And I'd never, ever had this happen. So everybody in the front's like pushing their call light to get the flight attendant to come up. And she walks up to me and, and looks over at me. And she goes, yes, can I help you? And I said, do you not hear the front door is, is you know, oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. You know, the front door is, is hissing. Is the door, is there a problem? She goes, well, we blew out the seal to that door on our way over here earlier today. But don't worry, it's got a couple of locking mechanisms. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. I'm freaking out. Everybody's freaking out. The, p the pilot, though, didn't fly at an altitude of 30,000 feet and instead flew somewhere around 15,000 feet. And at that altitude, well, the door could seal back up again. That's why the pressure here is so much lower. I will never, ever forget that flight. So there you go. That's vertical pressure variations. Now, if I were to show you the pressure right now in Denver, Colorado, and you compare it to the Champaign, you would think that there would be a hurricane force wind between Denver and Champaign, but there's not. And the reason why there isn't is because in order to understand how to use pressure differences to gauge wind speed, you have to compare it constant altitude. You see, this is a cross section of the United States. So here's the Atlantic Coastal Plain. Here's a sea level, the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. Here's the Appalachian Mountains. Here's the Mississippi River Valley. And here we go toward higher and higher altitude as we climb the Great Plains. We then get into the Rocky Mountains, the Intermountain West, the Sierra Nevadas, and then the Pacific Ocean. Basically, I just took a cross section right across this map right here. Now, if you were to just look at what uh, station pressure, that's pressure measured at a weather station, look like, the pressure is much, much, much lower here in the mountains because the altitude is so much higher. It's also lower right in through there. But you see, you can't compare pressure at different altitudes. You have to always do it at the same altitude. So the fact that Denver sitting here always has a lower air pressure than Champaign is simply because it's higher in altitude. If I wanted to compare pressures, I need to go up about a mile above Champaign so I can compare same altitude or take both of them down to sea level. And that's what we do. You see, air pressure decreases rapidly with height. Just to make another point here, what I've got here in this map that's in the upper right here, well, this is the top of Mount Everest. And at the top of Mount Everest, the atmospheric pressure there is about, well, just 30% of what you've got right here. It's amazing to think that some people can climb to the top of Mount Everest without bringing oxygen along. Certainly the Sherpas do it all the time. But these uh, people like to climb mountains. They almost always have to bring oxygen. Otherwise, they'll get hypoxia. But at that altitude, you need to take basically three huge gulps of air to get the same amount of air that you get in your lungs down here at the surface. So, what's the point? If you want to find the wind speed and direction, you always have to compare pressure at constant altitudes. Okay, here's where we finish. Why does the wind blow? Check out this massive circulation around this low pressure system right here. Why is the wind so much faster here than over here? Well, the answer lies in this image. You see, what you're looking at on this map, those lines are isobars, lines of constant pressure. And basically, an isobar in its spacing tells you how strong the horizontal pressure gradient is. Look at how tightly packed together they are right around that low pressure center. Wind speed is color coded on this map. Over here, where we had slow winds, look at how far apart the isobars are. 
So the closer they are, the faster the winds. So again, in notes, this is the key relationship. The closer the spacing of the isobars, the faster the winds will be. Basically, you're representing a strong pressure gradient the closer the spacing. This is Hurricane Maria. Incredibly powerful. In fact, no, wait a minute. That's Hurricane Irma. Maria and Irma are actually quite uh, close to one another. Hurricane Irma right here. Look at how fast the winds are spinning around Irma. Look at how tight the pressure gradient is. So to make sure you know this, here's a question for you. Illinois is this state right here, in case you didn't know, okay? Maybe some of you are geographically uh, challenged. My question for you is, which day was windier in Illinois? Day A or day B? Think about it. All right, what do you got? Well, the answer is day A. Now, why not day B? You might see this big giant H there. Well, that's a big area of high pressure. High pressure has clear skies and calm winds. There's a very, very weak pressure gradient. Look at the spacing between the isobars. It's enormous. Now, when you think about that compared to this one, look at how tight the spacing is of the isobars here. They're all packed in really tight in this little area. And therefore, we had a really, really strong wind. In fact, this state was right out of the south going across Illinois. That's how you use maps that show pressure to determine wind. And that will be a constant theme throughout the rest of the semester because severe winds are a major part of many different types of severe weather. So that's it on pressure. We'll be applying these principles throughout the rest of the semester.